So the goal is to mimic that effect that beaver used to have on the landscape by quote, artificially placing what, what a beaver might have placed there, but doing it ourselves in the form of harvesting and placing sticks and small trees and trunks, you know, dead sagebrush and greasewood, whatever we can find to mimic that sort of biological material being placed in the stream. Here's a fun fact. Before European settlement, as much as 10% of the continental U.S. was influenced by the presence of beaver dams. Although beavers have been displaced from much of their historic range, land managers don't have to be high and dry in their absence. More and more people are rehydrating their land by mimicking beavers to catch and hold more water. In this episode of Voices from the Field, Aaron Clausen of the World Wildlife Fund and Montana rancher Amber Smith chat with NCAT regenerative grazing specialist Linda Poole about constructing do-it-yourself beaver dams, also called beaver dam analogs. Built mostly by hand with carefully placed sticks and rocks, these low-tech, affordable structures can help landowners safely catch and hold more water on their land during runoff. You'll also hear a bit about Aaron's work with the World Wildlife Fund's Ranching Sustainability and Viability Program and Amber's leadership of the nonprofit Women in Ranching. Let's listen. Hi, this is Linda Poole, a regenerative grazing specialist with NCAT's Soil for Water and Sustainable Ag Programs. And welcome to today's podcast. And this will be news that you can use for anyone who's facing droughts especially in these trying times when we, when we do get rain, it's either a deluge, we're flooded, or else there's not enough. And, and what little bit we have just gives us hope, but doesn't give us grass or anything more. And so what we have been thinking about at the Soil for Water program is how to catch and hold more water in your soil. And we talk a lot about restoring the soil sponge through building soil biology and managing ground cover and things like this. But another option that not everybody thinks about so much is a concept of land forming. The idea of changing topography in order to change the flow of water. Gravity is our friend if we can master the topography. And for decades now, people like Dave Rosgen and Bill Zedike have been talking uh, and teaching us land managers about how to use artificial structures, really well-designed structures to induce meandering in streams as a way to help them reconnect with their water table and create a broader riparian zone. And so a green area where there's water in the, in the subsurface um, for a longer period of time, which is important both to us as graziers, that's, that's grass, That's what we need for our livestock, but it's also important for wildlife and it's tremendously important for downstream water users. Today, more than ever, it's important. And one of the challenges with the type of work that that Dave Rosgen has done is it can be really expensive and it involves a lot of heavy equipment. Bill Zedike has, in his way of, of inducing meandering, does a lot of low tech process-based structures, rocks and sticks and posts that you put in. And he's been having a lot of success with that for years. And kind of an evolution in that is a, is a new, exciting thing that, that we're doing here in Montana and in a lot of other places called Beaver Dam Analogs. And so today we have with us Amber Smith and Aaron Clausen to talk about their experience in building beaver dam analogs in our dry country here in Montana. Amber is a rancher. She, with her partner and her two children here in central Montana, raise commercial cattle and they run a custom grazing business. Together, they steward over 50,000 acres of prairie grasslands. And Amber's passion, and I'll let her talk about it more, but it is so inspiring because it's building a future where where the people here thrive and are supported in pursuing work that that 
feeds deeper values. At the same time, it's profitable enough to stay. And in addition to, you know, as if that's not enough work, running cows on 50,000 acres and raising two kids, uh, Amber's also the executive director of a wonderful program called Women in Ranching. And a little later on, we'll let her talk about that. And Erin Clausen is the senior program officer for the World Wildlife Fund Sustainable Ranching Initiative. And um, if you're old like me and uh, have lived in the ranching com uh, community for a long time, you might scratch your head and say, World Wildlife Fund Sustainable Ranching, what's that about? You know, and this is some of the really exciting stuff, even bigger than beaver dam analogs is the is the power of collaboration between the the ranching community and the conservation community. So we're gonna talk about beaver dam analogs in depth, and then we're gonna say, how does that relate to this bigger relationship between taking care of the land, taking care of our communities? And so uh, let's start with you, Amber, and welcome to the program. And could you start by kind of rounding out your, uh, your bio a little bit for our listeners? Sure, thanks. Thanks for having me today, Linda. And um, we steward Antelope Springs Ranch here in Eastern Montana. As Linda said, it's 53,000 acre um, private ranch. My partner and I do not own any land, um, which is maybe a, a little bit unique, but it's becoming more common in the West is having folks who have the skills and the knowledge, uh, but maybe who don't have the cash outlay to be owners of properties, but who certainly can do the work of, of caring for it and stewarding it really well. So that's part, part of my job. And as Linda mentioned later on today, I'll be talking about our new organization, Women in Ranching. Erin, how about, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit more about your background, please? Sure. Yeah. So I as you said, and with the Wildlife Fund Sustainable Ranching Initiative, I am a group of folks probably generally referred to as conservationists or ecologists. So I, for the past 10 years, have worked in Montana, mostly on private lands, working with farmers and ranchers on helping them reach their sustainable management, habitat for wildlife, water quality, soil quality goals on their operation. In Montana, where Wildlife Fund works with a, quite a number of ranchers now for this effort, with our kind of theory of that work being that the, the key to long-term uh, intact grasslands in this short grass prairie region of kind of eastern Montana, western Dakotas, is helping keep those families that you were just talking about, Linda, that hold these deeper values and that manage and steward the grasslands to help keep them on the grasslands through a variety of means. We, we work with people on grassland restoration. We work with helping people in their transitioning their operation to the next generation and practices like we're gonna talk about today, which hopefully result in keeping more water, which will grow more grass, which will keep you profitable and hopefully keep your family and and keep the grasslands in the same place. Yeah, I think we can just build right on where you where you left that, Erin. Can you talk with us about what what beaver dam analogs do for this idea of helping people stay on the ground and and be profitable? You know, kind of what is a beaver dam analog, and and why is it of value to the World Wildlife Fund? Sure. So for that, it might take. You know, it might make sense to take a little bit of a step back and think about what this landscape looked like, you know, maybe even just 200 years ago. It's pretty well documented in the Lewis and Clark journals and pretty definitively how many beaver were in this landscape and talking about not just the, the grasslands, but the Intermountain West, so getting into the Rocky Mountains of North Idaho and Montana. How many beaver were living here and modifying the landscape? and what that actually made the landscape look like and how it functioned. So part of beaver's life history is that most everybody knows, even from the time they're a kid, is that they eat, they eat bark, they take trees down, and they dam streams and rivers. 
And what that does is just like any dam, like the dams that we ourselves build is pond water up behind the dam, storing it either temporarily or for long term, but also spreading it out in that area behind the dam. And so that impact of that, when you have, and there are estimates of how many beaver, and they're always, it's, it's hard to get estimates on things like that many hundreds of years later, but that there were upwards of 10 to 40 million to maybe 100 million beaver, we don't really know, but tens of millions of beavers in the landscape that kind of aren't there now, doing this effect of ponding, storing, spreading out water, which in the arid west where we are, where you are, Amber and Linda, when you only get 10 inches of rain a year, depending on when you get it, spreading and storing out water can make a big difference in how much you're effectively irrigating all that grass that you're then gonna rely on to, to graze. So the goal is to mimic that effect that beaver used to have on the landscape by quote, artificially placing what, what a beaver might have placed there, but doing it ourselves in the form of harvesting and placing sticks and small trees and trunks or fence posts, sod, mud, sagebrush, dead, you know, dead sagebrush and greasewood, whatever we can find to mimic that sort of biological material being placed in the stream, uh, temporarily ponding and storing and spreading out water. So that's the, that's the goal. The, the impact that can have for, I'll say for wildlife maybe, and, let, and then let Amber talk about the impact it could have for ranching. But the impact for wildlife is that those communities, those plant communities that are gonna grow and thrive in areas that are wetted by water are pretty different than, than those you'd find like in the uplands in, in the in the dry, short grass, shrublands of where they don't, where the water table doesn't reach. And they harbor a lot more flowering plants. So the, the plant diversity tends to be greater in those areas, which increases the insect diversity you'll find there, bees, butterflies. So we hear a lot about pollinators as well as beavers. You're gonna find more of those in places where you have flowering plants. And then really importantly for birds, uh, especially game birds, when they're rearing their broods, young birds, rely really heavily on soft body bugs. So it's kind of a cascade of effects of spreading out the water, um, which is kind of increasing your, your wetland, your aquatic habitat, and then sort of trickling down into the insects and bird populations. So we also talk a lot about sage grouse in this area. Wetlands are really key for, for sage grouse to be able to rear their young. So you, know, you could often find, that would be where you'd find sage grouse as well. Yeah. Amber, why, why would a rancher do this? Why was it worth your time and resources? So when you look at these, you know, semi-arid to arid landscapes in the West, the areas on the ranch, the coolies, the draws, which are already naturally holding more moisture, they're holding snow through the winter, that's where we're gonna have green grass. And so implementing beaver dam analogs is allowing us to extend that time of green growth. And anytime you have photosynthesis going on on your property, it's a good thing, whether it's for horses that you, you know, your five horses or a thousand cows or the deer you like to see walking by in the morning or the antelope, they all depend on those places, particularly as the summer wears on and you get into August and September. So, for us, it's just really a no-brainer to, you know, we've made a lot of impact over the last 10 years on this ranch uh, with our grazing management. And so all of the key ecological indicators that we've been looking to see shift, bare ground, plant diversity, increased litter, increased soil cover, we've been able to do all of those things through good holistic planned grazing management. But in my mind, there's, we're just barely scratching the surface. So good grazing management is one thing we can do. And if you think about these landscapes and what was occurring on them before we put in fences and before we started set stocking livestock, you had a lot of movement, you had a lot of flow, you had a lot of life being generated. Um, and so, you know, the BDAs, this year we, put them in 
think it was June, late May or June that all of those went went in on cottonwood, the cottonwood draw, I would call it because it's mostly dry. And our only measurable rainfall since really, I don't know, years, like two years, our actual measurable rainfall happened the first week of July. Bizarrely had five inches of rain. And so it was really great to have those uh, BDAs already in on cottonwood and to be able to go down and, you know, two weeks after that rain event, we still had water hanging out in that draw. And so we had a group here visiting the ranch and we took them down to see the beaver dam analogs. And we were talking all about how it's providing great habitat for sage grouse. And our dog kicked up 20 to 30 sage grouse like right where we were standing and you know we as people are so quick to not see all the things that are happening we never would have seen those sage grouse if max hadn't kicked them up out of the sagebrush for us that was exciting to see right here we are telling folks like this is why this is important and valuable and then there's there's the birds right there like as we're stepping around them and not even knowing it so there's a lot of things taking place on the landscape. And I think, you know, we as ranchers like to think we have it figured out and that we're good managers and good grazers and, you know, being profitable is extremely important because without profitability, we certainly couldn't be here. Uh, <laughs> as young people stepping into agriculture, and if you don't have an owned ranch and if you don't own your cows, you certainly don't have a relationship with the bank. And so if you're, a, you know, we have to stay cash flow positive. Um, so my husband and I are making choices all of the time that we probably wouldn't make if we had the luxury of owned land and all of our cows bought and paid for. So honestly, any, any impact that we can make additionally on top of good grazing is of benefit. And so when we find an organization and really, you know, it's never about the organization, it's, it's about the relationships. And so Aaron and his team with the Sustainable Ranching Initiative show up in the right kind of way and they are trustworthy. And, you know, when they come out to the ranch, they're just adding a new lens to the landscape. So this morning, the reason I was late to this wonderful call, <laughs> we were out moving cows. And so the lens that I had was, what's my horse up to? Are both the kids safe on their horses? Our goal is to get to this gate. Are the pairs picking up their calves? You know, are the cows being pleasant about this situation? And then we've got one rider loping around a hill because the cows were going to go around the hill and head south. Like that, that is my view most of the time. That's the predominant view I have of this landscape is getting work done, getting animals moved to places at the right time for the right reason, making sure they have water. When Aaron and his team come to the ranch and we're out, you know, driving and showing them what's going on, what they're seeing is look at all those pronghorn and look at all those birds. And I wonder what birds those are. And that's a completely different view of the land. It's a very necessary view. And so when we're able to bring new partners with new ideas and a new lens on the land, um, it can only benefit the operation. That's well said. I just uh, recorded a podcast last week with my neighbor, Leo Barthelmas, who both Aaron and Amber work with and know. And he said that one of the greatest gifts of this idea of the prairies are precious and collaboration is how we're going to help them move forward. He said one of the greatest gifts was like a new set of eyes that he got, you know, to look at the prairie in a really different way. And I think you just said that too, Amber. So that, that was great to hear. Uh, Aaron, I wonder if, you know, we're talking about beaver dam analogs and I'll bet people are wondering just, I mean, really, how do you build these things? What are they made of? When I think about beaver dams, I think about mud and sticks and, you know, right in the creek, there's mud, there's sticks, it's impervious, the water goes over the top. How similar or different are the structures that you're building 
with ranchers here in Montana? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I guess, you know, my background is in, in biological science. I got a science degree, so I really appreciate like the engineering and, and scientific rigor that we can apply to these sorts of things. And, and especially when it comes to finding out like how effective they are. But I, I think the really nice thing about BDAs is that we can kind of meet, strike a balance between that and just practical solutions for ecological resiliency. I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but we all certainly put like sticks or played in small streams and like blocked water at the beach with like whatever we had available to us, like while we were just sitting there. And it can be nearly that simple. So the, the most basic idea is just using rocks, limbs of trees, or whole willows, usually bundled up, and just placing those in the stream to block water. There are a couple different types of, you know, you talked about Bill Zedike, this, this, the rock structures he designed, mostly most of the structures he designed are based around using large sort of like one foot diameter, maybe a little bit smaller rocks. Those are designed to not necessarily pond water, but to prevent erosion uh, by armoring areas where there might be a head cut and maybe diverting water to a place where it wasn't going in a dry stream. The beaver dam analogs are designed a little bit differently to actually mimic a beaver dam and stop water. So to do that, you typically are building the dam, you know, crosswise in the stream from bank to bank, trying to get it to the point where it will block the high flow of water, which can be really hard to figure out what high flow is in a stream that only flows for two days a year after high rain. And then also typically using like a mud or some kind of some kind of sod on the upstream side to actually kind of fill the gaps in between the individual limbs. So if you imagine like a willow, a lattice of willows is still going to allow water through, like a like a leaky weir, which is another thing that these are called, which is fine. That's okay. It's still going to stop some water. But the idea with a properly functioning BDA is that it would be nearly impermeable to water, at least when you install it, so that it's ponding and, and behind the dam spreading water out on the floodplain. There are other structures that have kind of tiered off of BDAs that are often used in, in concert with them that are more, more leaky or so they're intended to just kind of temporarily slow water down. Um, when water slows down, it, it drops silt out. So like in a reservoir of a big dam, there's often meters and meters of silt at, at the bed. Uh, flowing water carries silt, still water lets it drop out. So behind, the, behind these BDAs or behind these leaky weirs, hopefully the, this is adding to the ecological function by allowing that silt to drop out, increasing the base elevation of the, of the stream, which will make it even easier for that water to spread out in later years. And then there are other structures that are that are more like dikes almost that are designed to just like push water one way or another in a stream. So in a really entrenched, downcut, straight flowing stream, to introduce more of that meandering character of a natural stream, you might put um, basically just a flow diverter, so like an energy diverter in one side of the stream so that it pushes the water in the opposite side and causes some of that lateral erosion. Um, which also hopefully gets more sediment on the stream bed and help raise the elevation again. So, but at the end of the day, you are just putting to your best abilities, putting sticks in streams that are going to stay there and block water. So two things come to mind on that. Um, our listeners are probably going induce erosion. How can that be good? And uh, we'll put in the show notes for, for this podcast, some information to help you understand how erosion can be your friend. Erosion happens. It's like, how do, you, how do you direct it so that it is a force for healing instead of for degradation? And we'll put some, some links in the notes for that. Season four of Fresh Growth, Approaches to a More Sustainable Future from Western Ag Practitioners is just getting started. Listen in and you'll hear from farmers and ranchers throughout the West about the specific, creative, sustainable practices they are using in their operation. 
why they made the changes, and how implementing such practices has helped both their natural resource goals and their financial bottom line. Cover crops, raising livestock, soil health, growing for local markets, and building farmer networks are all topics covered. This podcast can be found on all major platforms. Another thing that came to my mind, I spent a couple years working with a land trust in Colorado where there was a lot of interest in this type of work, either restoring beaver themselves, uh, you know, so you didn't have to build the analogs, you just had the beaver, or using BDAs. And there was a lot of concern about water rights and permitting because you would be working in the channels of the streams. So Aaron, as you're helping people think about this, uh, what about those two things? Does, do you, is it going to affect your water rights? I know that in some places it does. You have, to, you have to work your way through this. In other places it doesn't. And what about Army Corps or other permits that you might need to have to do this type of work? Yeah, there's a lot to dig into there. But so to start, maybe I'd just talk about, you talked about restoring beaver, which in an ideal situation, we could bring beaver in and they would do a lot of this work for us. But there's a couple unknowns and that is in some of these really dry streams and creeks like Cottonwood Creek where, where Amber was talking about, we really don't know if beaver were there. They might've been, it's hard to know if they were or not. We can still use some of these processes in their absence to spread water out and take advantages of that. Yeah. And, and maybe someday, it, a, a beaver, there would be enough ponding happening there for a beaver to, a beaver community to, to live and do some of that work sort of for free for us. There are other places that people do this work where it's very clear there were beaver. Ponding brings beavers in immediately. And that's a little bit different than some of these dry prairie streams that we work in. So just to make that note. For permitting, yeah, it's, it's very dependent again on where you're working. So the same example, this really dry stream which is only active during rainfall would be classified as an ephemeral an ephemeral stream there's a lot of back and forth always subject to whichever administration is is taking the helm about the interpretation of the clean water act which is where the army corps of engineers permitting to be able to place fill material and or pollutants in the stream but here we're just talking about fill material so Technically, these structures would could constitute fill material and in certain circumstances would need to be reviewed, permitted by the Clean Water Act to be able to place them. For most of where we're working in eastern Montana right now, it's settings like this, which maybe they flow once or twice a year following a heavy rain event. They're not maintained by, by a low water or by a high water table. So they're considered ephemeral, which are not required to be permitted. There are, again, people are doing work in places where beaver definitely lived, bigger streams, ponding immediately brings them in, they flow year round. Those projects have a little bit more of an administrative burden because they have to go through that process. Yeah. Yeah. So really what it boils down to is check your local rules. And one place you might do that would be to go to your conservation district. We all have conservation districts and that might be a first place to go for people who are considering doing this on their own because this is something that you can do on your own. And Amber, uh, now that you've had some of these built, I'd kind of like to hear about how did you get them built? You know, did you do it yourself? Did you have a team? Are you looking at any risk with having them there? Kind of what's it like to be the landowner who all of a sudden has, has the chance to catch and hold more water with these beaver dam analogs? So the benefit of not doing this by yourself is World Wildlife Fund did all the work to figure out if there was any regulations that would stop us from doing this work. We did none of that. We don't have time for that. So we were really appreciative of their knowledge and expertise and the time they took to figure that out. And then World Wildlife Fund was able to, and Aaron can probably talk about this better. The terms I'll use are not probably the right terms, but they partnered up with the Montana Conservation Corps. And so we had four or five young folks here for two hitches, which is about two weeks. Each hitch is about two weeks. We had a couple of volunteer days, which was 
really fun just to have all sorts of people out on the ranch. I actually, I think I took either I took a picture or I just took a mental picture because I didn't want to be rude, but <laughs> we had more environmental bumper stickers on this ranch than I've ever seen probably in my life. And it was great. It was just young people who were, you know, excited to be out here and doing something different. And the Montana Conservation Corps, those crews are young folks from all over the US. So we had one of the kids was from Maryland and Rhode Island and California and Oregon and Washington. Um, so they had never been on landscape like this. So, you know, it was just really, I hope, a pleasure for everyone. It was certainly a pleasure for us. Maybe there's ranchers who have enough help on their place to do as many as the Conservation Corps did, but at least for us, um, as we've been in drought, we don't have an employee. And so we're doing everything by ourselves and we just didn't have the capacity. Yeah. Did not have the capacity to do that all ourselves. So it was wonderful, you know, partnering with an organization that had the connections and the contacts to just help us get it done and implemented. So now we have, I think we have about 57 structures on cottonwood and, you know, Aaron's come out with his drone. And so the monitoring has already begun. And if it had been my husband and I, <laughs> maybe we would have gotten three done. And then it's just like busy. It's hot and busy. And we've got our own cows and other people's cattle that we're managing. So it was really nice having the support and the help. And if I know anything about ranchers, there's always important things that need to be done. So if you can find folks who are excited to do it with you, it, it makes it that much better. Yeah, great. So listening to all this, my guess is some of our listeners are thinking, I want to try this. So uh, could either of you give, give our listeners some idea of where can they learn more about this? And if they do want to give it a try, where could they maybe find some help? you know, a community to learn how to do this or, or actual help like you, like you benefited from your knowing Aaron and WWF. What's on offer for people who want to give this a try? I could take a stab and, and maybe Amber could elaborate on some of the other groups she works with that I think do are starting to get dip a toe in this too. But there are a few organizations now in Montana, like Amber said, that have kind of started to partner together to make this work more approachable. You know, Amber has said that that we show up in, in the right way. And, and I think we are all excited to do this work, but we all, you know, we wouldn't be able to do any of it if we didn't have ranchers like Amber and Trevor and, and others that work with us through our ranching program that are just willing to look at some of these unconventional, untested ideas and say, let's, within reason, if the risk is low, let's see how this works. And at the end of the day, like <laughs> all the anecdotes that you just heard, it's kind of fun. Like when you, to find out, I, I cannot remember where I heard this, but it was, I think, a question of where do you find the people that are doing work or are having, enjoying their career the most. And it's like, you just look where people are having fun and enjoying themselves. And they're probably pretty serious and seeing results towards the goals that they're trying to achieve too. And so in Montana to kind of start to tackle this, we have worked through a partnership with the Nature Conservancy who has a program, pretty robust conservation program in Eastern Montana to amongst the ranches that we work with individually and together, just find out who wants to do this sort of work. There were a few that definitely did like, like Amber and Trevor and, and a few others. Uh, that we started on this year. And so we did four projects together and I think 60 on, on your ranch, Amber, and totaling all the rest, maybe we'll get to between 120 and 150 structures this year. Wow. And just like every conservation group, we kind of cobble things together. We, we've had a diverse set of fundraising. So we had some funds through our ranching program. We partnered with the Nature Conservancy on a grant to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And then we've also started partnering with Montana Conservation Corps to do the actual work on the ground, because unlike other conservation practices where you could hire someone to lay the pipe or NRCS might help 
design the, the fencing and you just need to find a fencing contractor. Building BDAs is something that you can't just go to the yellow pages and figure out who's going to do that work for you. And it's also a pretty interesting, unusual thing to try to cost share from a, like a organizational perspective. So MCC has been so key to this, Montana Conservation Corps has been so key to this partnership. They, for a long time, have had the their youth crews and their young adult crews do trail work in Montana. And we've partnered with them this year to put a crew together that just does this work. So you could talk to any of those groups I just mentioned, you know, World Wildlife Fund, Nature Conservancy, Montana Conservation Corps. The conservation districts are very well integrated the county offices and then the state organization that is kind of an umbrella over them does a lot of watershed work and is a good dot connector. Uh, Pheasants Forever and Winnet Aces and the Rancher Stewardship Alliance also all are starting to dabble in this. And I know Amber and, and your Linda affiliation with them. So it'd be, I think it'd be easy in Montana to pretty quickly find someone who would be willing to come help out. Yeah, and we will put some online resources for people who are just getting started and don't have the blessing of living here where it's so dry that that we really do partner up on thinking about how to how to survive the drought and and keep people on the land. Amber, I was wondering, you know, it seems to me like this story is so much about collaboration. It's about finding common ground it's actually almost new ground that you're finding where you can work together and one of the things that intrigues me about you is is the women in ranching program a way to find women some support in working in ranching and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about about that program and what your hopes are for how that could transform our ability to stay on the ground and take care of the ground. Yes, I came into agriculture through true love. So I met my husband and at that point had grown up, I guess probably what a rancher would say is more environmentalist. I just grew up camping and fishing and hiking with my family and loved horses. And that was really my passion as a young adult and spent all of my time riding the Sagamon River in Illinois, uh, which is where I grew up. And then ended up in the West working on a guest ranch as a wrangler. And so met my husband. He was also a wrangler. We were on his family's place in the Nebraska Sand Hills, and then had the opportunity to come up here and lease this ranch. So we've been here for about 10 years. But when I was first invited to a gathering of women in ranching, it would have been spring of 2018. And we'd just gotten through a really tough tough winter. It was nasty cold. And I just got this innocuous message via Facebook from a, actually an apprentice who had, who had been here with us the summer before. And she said, I think you should come to this ladies thing in California. You would really like it. And I read it and it's blizzarding outside. And it's like, oh, that's fun. Well, that's never going to happen. And then the folks who were organizing just kept sending emails asking how I was, you know, that they really wanted me to come and how could they help support me to get there. And so against all odds, I made it happen. And it was really the first time in my experience in agriculture that I was around a group of women who were deeply passionate about land management. I mean, the first supper I sat next to someone and we were talking about the pros and cons of spaying heifers and managing cattle on a conservation easement in a neighborhood and how you're interacting with folks who have never been around livestock before. It was just really fantastic. And I felt honestly seen and heard and valued. And the overall message of that of that group was the more people at the soil surface active and bringing their creativity and bringing their skills to the land, the better for all of us and the next generation. So I've been able to continue that work since 2018 uh, for the last four years as a program. And now we've stepped out as our own organization this summer and folks show up at Women in Ranch. Not really a rancher. I'm, I'm the hired man's wife or I own a ranch, but I'm not really a rancher because I'm not included at the decision-making table. 
or I really like agriculture, but I'm not really a rancher because, you know, mostly I'm in support roles and raising my kids. And, you know, we're really creating a counter narrative against that and saying all of you who are on these landscapes and have been here caring for the land for time eternal women have been caring for land and caring for children, caring for animals, feeding their families. I guess I'm really confused and concerned why those folks wouldn't consider themselves the main decision maker or, or why they can't use the term, I am a rancher. So it's just been, it's, it has been and continues to be a real privilege to uh, participate with people as they're making that transition and as they're growing in their own courage, demanding a little more space in the room and, you know, advocating for a way of being on the land that has a more broad and more expansive view of how we can be taking care of it. You know, I'm, I, my kids, I have a son who's 10 and a daughter who's 12. And what I want them seeing from their parents is parents who are actively engaged, doing things that they're passionate about, finding joy in, working really, really hard. And that these kids, no matter what it is they want to do, whether they want to come back to a rural community or they want to get the hell out of here and go do something else, that they would walk into a world that's excited to see what they offer. And I think right now, all too often, we just have a very narrow view. And, you know, I have folks ask me, like, what does that mean? Or what are you talking about? If you pick up any agricultural publication, the you know, Beef Magazine, the Angus Journal, Nebraska Cattlemen's, and you flip through and look at the pictures, look at who's writing the articles, look at the stories they're telling. It's rarely, rarely ever featuring or holding up a woman as an expert, as a knowledge holder, as having a deep skill on the land. And we're just completely missing out. We are really missing out by not bringing those voices forward. So the first step is making sure the folks who have those stories and that knowledge um, have the courage to make space for themselves in a society that doesn't typically ask. <laughs> I mean, that's that's just where it's at. So le- yesterday, I was facilitating what we call kitchen table chats where we're featuring two different women. Sometimes they do similar work. Sometimes they do very, very different work. And, you know, they come and talk about the work they do. They talk about their skills. They share what they're up to. So yesterday we were featuring a woman here in Montana and one in California who are custom targeted weed grazers and are using small ruminants. So goats and sheep and you know, listening to their stories about having little, little kids and managing hundreds and thousands of animals and moving across different landscapes and typically working with anywhere between 30 and 50 different landowners, like the amount of relationships that they're holding, the amount of skill that takes, it's unfathomable and fun and exciting. And I hope, I hope people understand that really, no matter what you think or what you feel or how you might feel, you are or aren't accepted in a community. These landscapes and the future of agriculture and the future of business is in deep need of new entrepreneurial skills, new amounts of creativity. And so I'm just working with one little segment of the whole audience. And it's great. It's, it is truly a privilege. So uh, we have a really nice website. Uh, I love, I love what you're doing. I love the passion that you bring to it and, and the heart, you know, the compassion as well as the passion. Amber, where can they find your website? What is the link for your website? So we are women in ranching.co. Dot co. Dot co. Yep. Great. Yep. Great. Well, like, like I say, um, good for you. <laughs> good for us that you're doing this. Erin, I'd love to hear more about the RSVP program and, and your overall program that, that World Wildlife is doing too in, in relation to you know 
we at NCAT, we're about uh, regenerative farming and ranching. And so that's the particular bent that we have. But there's also this idea of if we don't maintain biodiversity, that uh, we're not going to win either. We've got climate challenges and we've got diversity challenges, biodiversity challenges, human diversity challenges. So what, what role is World Wildlife Fund playing in that? And what do you have to offer people who might be listening, who are going to be those farmers and ranchers? What, how, can they, how can they interact with WWF? Sure. So yeah, my work, uh, you mentioned in the intro, I'm, I'm part of our Sustainable Ranching Initiative, which World Wildlife Fund sits within our Northern Great Plains program. Uh, so yeah, that's another thing that people might not have known that we're a wildlife fund. We have obviously a lot of programs around the world and a really large program here in the US based in the Northern Great Plains, uh, which for the distinction from the broader Great Plains, which is just sort of the grasslands of the central US, the Northern Great Plains is that short grass, more semi-arid, arid, Western, Northwestern part of the Great Plains it's Eastern Montana, it's Western South Dakota, Nebraska, part of Wyoming, part of Canada. And the, the distinction it has from the rest of the Great Plains is that it's still relatively intact, meaning a lot of it hasn't been turned over for one reason or another to cropland. It's in excess of 70% still intact rangelands that are mostly managed by ranchers for, for grazing. And that's in contrast to the rest of the Great Plains, which is around 50% intact. So we're, we're focusing on the Northern Great Plains region, trying to preserve its intact character, work with the, the land stewards, the private landowners, the ranchers that, that manage it, that live there and take care of it, uh, with the goal, with the theory that long-term family operations that are themselves invested in the stewardship of the grasslands are the best way to keep those landscapes intact. So we have programs in our in our NGP that focus on making that easier for people or helping people reach those goals. There is part of our NGP team that works just with tribal communities on um, their capacity and their conservation programs. We have some species specific programs for black-footed ferrets and bison. And then we have the Sustainable Ranching Initiative, which there, there are four of us. I have a counterpart each in South Dakota and Nebraska as well. And we have a couple of programs that we work with ranchers on. We have a grass and restoration program where we have some funding from, uh, from RECIT, which is, which is Airwick, the Senate Oils Company, to provide just seed to people who want to reseed marginal cropland to grasslands. And then we have our flagship uh, ranch systems and viability planning program, which is funded by a, a lot of different partners, including some industries like McDonald's, Cargill, Walmart. We're also internally fundraising through grants from NRCS at the, the Department of Agriculture, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, so that program, RSVP, asks ranchers to enroll in the program and in exchange for them agreeing to not turn land into crop for 10 years. So it's a, non a 10 year non-conversion clause. We have sort of a three-pronged approach to providing assistance. We give uh, ecological monitoring on every ranch. It's really an intense protocol. So we're doing uh, 20 soil points of meter deep soil carbon testing, vegetation analysis and monitoring of diversity and forage production water quality, bird diversity surveys, and water infiltration. So getting at all those things you talked about in the intro about the soil, the soil sponge, the soil's ability to hold water, the soil's health. We have educational funding for ranches to send themselves or their heirs to like a ranch management or a financial management class. And then we have a conservation, sort of a conservation projects arm where we do work like we've been talking about uh, on ambers with putting in structures to help with water holding that simultaneously will help with wildlife habitat as well as more traditional just subdividing pastures with permanent or temporary fencing putting in permanent or temporary water we're starting to dip a toe into the virtual fencing arena which is really exciting and you know we're always looking for i guess a, a new way to do 
to bring kind of a maybe an untested conservation practice out to people that want to try it out and make that easy for them to do that where you know more more mainstream funding partners like the usda which isn't have the flexibility to kind of make its own you know within a county or within a state to make their own rules we can kind of help complement some of what they're offering and often do work together with them in a lot of projects yeah this is this is so exciting and encouraging you know i've been doing this type of work for 40 years and um, the progression is that you know as those of us who are range geeks you know are you going to look at the condition of the land or are you going to look at the trend of the land and our condition in in understanding how to be in good reciprocal relationships the condition is still not as good as it could be but man the trend is great and you guys have have demonstrated that today and we always like to uh leave our listeners with uh with final words from you and and uh messages of hope and so let's start with you Aaron and what kind of what would you like to tell people who've been listening to this podcast about, about collaboration and beaver dam analogs? Yeah, I'd say, and this, this pivots a little bit off what Amber was saying and just kind of elevating the work that people are doing that hasn't been, whether they haven't had a platform or that hasn't been, the work they're doing hasn't been talked about or there are opportunities to distribute more of the resources and sort of attention that we have amongst the people that produce our food. But another really big goal of ours at World Wildlife Fund within our sustainable ranching initiative is just to encourage everyone who benefits, everyone who's invested in these landscapes, which I would argue is nearly everybody that lives, you know, in the country, because we all eat food that comes from this region. We all are interested or our kids are interested in wildlife and we go to these places to recreate when we have free time. So we're all mentally and probably financially and through our diets invested in this landscape. So how can we connect those people who are invested with the stories that come out and with the work that needs to be done here to keep these landscapes intact? I think a lot of people who are interested are passionate about wildlife, don't understand how closely food production is tied to wildlife habitat, especially in regions like this, which are intact habitats in their nearly natural state, which is really uncommon in the world today, and, and how we can produce food and, and keep those landscapes intact at the same time is just something I think everyone needs to be aware of and invested in long term if we're going to keep doing this so uh yeah this has been great thanks so much yeah well said you thank you amber how about you that was really nicely said aaron so i'll piggyback a little bit on what aaron said and if you're not if you're listening and you're not in agriculture i hope you'll take a little bit of time to find and meet someone who is and to hear about their life and their work and their communities. Um, there's there's a lot of value to spend a little time with someone that you might not identify with. And for those of you in agriculture, you know, I would just encourage you, drought is always going to be present with us and uh, good years and bad years of cattle sales is always going to be present with us, but really leaning on and remembering the value of community and how you treat one another and how you show up for one another, the type of people you choose to spend time with. And my own life experience has been if you treat other people how you would like to be treated, really great potential partners show up. A few show up and they're not the right partners. And so just keep doing you and taking care of the land and the right folks do show up. It's a hard, interesting, fascinating life and if you do nothing and you just stay in your bubble and you don't ever collaborate and try, I can promise you one thing I can guarantee you is nothing will happen. So maybe try something, get life a little interesting, make sure it gives your neighbor something to talk about. And I promise you, you'll, you'll get to the end of your story and you're going to look back and have good memories. So that's what we're here trying to do is make those good memories and give our kids an opportunity to have them too. 
You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. And listeners, thank you for tuning into this. In the show notes, we'll have links to to websites and and contact information for uh, women in ranching and for World Wildlife Fund's Sustainable Ranching Initiative. Uh, Again, thank you so much for bringing yourselves to the challenge that is ranching in the Northern Great Plains. And with these types of people, how can we not succeed? So thank you again. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.